yesterday what we did was last we completed we studied the fluid mosaic model we studied how the phospholipids are present we studied the various phospholipids and we then studied the proteins we studied integral and membrane peripheral proteins and we finally yesterday our last class our last portion was that how the membrane proteins are linked to a variety of lipids in the membrane when they are present as peripheral proteins so yesterday i talked about this particular phenomena known as gpi that is glycosyl gpi linkage that is glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol modification found in uh, mem uh, membrane structures now prior to that this is uh, uh, this is how a lipid bilayer looks and a lot of proteins are attached to the phospholipids by certain unique structures so you can see a protein is attached to the palmitoyl group a protein is attached to the myristoyl group so this is known as myristoylation this is known as palmitoylation you can see a protein attached to the um, uh, to the phospholipid by a geranyl geranyl so this is known as geranyl geranylation and you can see a protein attached to the phospholipid by a farnesyl group so this is farnesylation so these are various modifications that are observed in glyco i mean to say lipoproteins because proteins here are attached to the lipid molecules and one point to be noted note here this is the outside this leaflet is facing the outside of the cell this lipid uh, this uh, leaflet is facing the interior of the cell when i talk about a lipid bilayer this is the outer leaflet and this is the inner leaflet so you see the proteins which are attached to the inner leaflet at times are attached to the phospholipids by a palmitoylation or, or, or a palmitoyl group or a myristoyl group or a geranyl geranyl group or a farnesyl group when i talk about the exterior of the cell surface and when i'm talking about the outer leaflet you can see that in this particular structure what you can see is that a protein is being attached to the outer surface of the plasma membrane by the presence of by the help of carbohydrates so this is the glycan portion this is the carbohydrate portion by which the protein is being attached to phosphatidyl inositol phosphatidyl inositol is a phospholipid so we have a lipid structure and we have a protein structure here intermediate we can see that there is a, a carbohydrate structure that is attaching this protein molecule to this phospholipid if we look into this carbohydrate part there are three different categories of carbohydrate present the green part is a mannose sugar the blue part is a glucosamine and the red part is the attachment of the inositol so this is the inositol group so this is the gpi uh, modification that is found on the outer surface of the lipid bilayer so this was this is the gpi anchored proteins these proteins are anchored to the phospholipid by the gpi anchorage so this was something i was talking about yesterday and next we move to another part that is so we understood one fact that carbohydrates are in majority present on the exterior surface that is they are attached to lipids or proteins on the outer leaflet of the lipid bilayer the carbohydrate molecules here the blue colors indicate the sugar residues the carbohydrate molecules may remain attached to lipids directly so is glycolipids or the carbohydrate molecules may remain attached to the proteins so these are the glycoproteins and we so we also have certain transmembrane glycoprotein so keep it in mind that whenever we think of the plasma membrane and again i'm repeating there is a inner leaflet 
facing the cytosol. There is an outer leaflet facing the exterior of the cell. And the oligosaccharide chains are always found on the extracellular part of most plasma membrane. So we see that the oligosaccharides or the carbohydrates are extensively coating the outer surface of the plasma membrane. They are attached to the membrane uh, molecules, proteins in form of glycoproteins or lipids in form of glycolipids. Certain polysaccharide, uh, polysaccharide chains, as you can see, are also in this particular picture attached to an integral membrane protein. So this is an integral membrane protein. This is a proteoglycan molecule, okay? Uh, and uh, since in most cases, carbohydrates are restricted, the carbohydrate rich zone is restricted to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. Often the term cell coat or glycocalyx are used to describe the carbohydrate rich zone on the cell surface. So when we talk about glycocalyx, it means nothing but the carbohydrate rich zone present on the outer surface of the plasma membrane. So keep that in mind that the carbohydrates are always restricted to the outer leaflet of the lipid bilayer. Yesterday, I was also talking, and I'll not go into details about lipid raft. I just want to show you how a lipid raft, how rafts look. Yesterday, when we studied the Singer-Nicholson model, what did we understood? We understood that the lipid is, that the um, uh, plasma membrane is composed of a lipid bilayer. There are proteins interspersed within this bilayer. Some proteins are present on the peripheral side, some proteins are present on the cytosolic phase. Some proteins travel through the membrane. So this is a study we learned. Today we learned that the carbohydrates are restricted to the outer leaflet only. Further, from yesterday's concept, we got that the lipid molecules can move laterally. So there is lateral movement. The proteins also can move laterally. So that gives the fluidity to the membrane. We also got from yesterday's concept that the type of phospholipids found on the outer leaflet is not always similar on the inner leaflet. We also studied yesterday that the number of proteins present on the outer leaflet is not always equal to the variety and the number of proteins present in the inner leaflet. So we understood that the membrane is fluid and the membrane is asymmetric. Yesterday, I also said that presently the concept is that since the proteins and the lipids can move in within the membrane, because this, there is a fluidity in the membrane, so at times there is a local aggregation of proteins and lipids occurring within the membrane. So they have become locally clustered. This interaction, protein, 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 lipid, and lipid-lipid interaction within the membrane brings them together and they compartmentalize the membrane. You see here in this particular picture, if you look, these portions have come together, they are interacting. So this portion has become a separate compartment in the membrane. These portions, you see, these are free from such interactions, but this portion, the proteins have come together to interact with each other. The lipid molecules have come together to interact with each other. So this is the concept of raft domain. For example, let me give you a very simple example. When a signaling molecule from the environment reaches the plasma membrane, there are receptors for the signaling molecule. In the normal condition, these receptors are present separately. They are present as single entities in the membrane. They are dispersed throughout the membrane. But the moment the signaling molecule starts moving towards the membrane, the receptors understand that there is a signaling molecule coming for it. So they tend to aggregate. They move through the membrane. They tend to aggregate and come to come near to one another. So this local aggregation is sort of a raft. That means 
we have to understand that there will be some interaction going on here. There is some crosstalk going on here, some amount of networking going on here. As a result of which some signals may move inward or some signals may move outward. Usually in the raft areas, we get the preponderance of cholesterol, huge amount of cholesterol, sphingolipids, glycolipids and GPI anchors. Just now I showed you how a GPI anchor looks. GPI anchors are found in the raft domain. So with that basic concept of raft domain, I will now move on to another small part, a relevant part, that is membrane dynamics. See, the normal physiological temperature of the membrane is about 20 to 40 degrees centigrade. That's a normal physiological temperature. When the membrane is below the normal physiological temperature, you're below, the membrane is below your, the, the normal physiological temperature, what, we, what it is observed is that the all categories of motion within the lipid bilayer is restricted. The bilayer is almost crystalline. So molecular movement within the bilayer lateral movement of the lipid and the protein molecules within the bilayer is restricted. But if the membrane is above the normal physiological temperature, it has been observed, as you know, temperature provides kinetic energy. The moment you start increasing the temperature, you're giving heat. Whenever there is heat, obviously the amount of kinetic energy increases. So whenever there is a higher temperature than the normal physiological one, it has been observed that the membrane fluidity increases. That means the lipid molecules can undergo the variety of movement it usually does. I'll come to those movements later on. I'll, I'll be coming into, to the movements in the next slide. So there are two states in which a membrane can exist, a liquid order state and a liquid disorder state. A liquid order state means that the membrane, that there is restriction of all kinds of movements within the membrane. While a liquid disorder state means that the molecules within the membrane can move, can move, can the fatty acid tails can rotate along their axis. There can be lateral movement of uh, lipids as well as lateral movement of proteins. So these are the two states in which the membrane stays. So we'll know this much from now. There is one liquid order state where the movement of molecules are restricted and a liquid disorder state which allows the movement of molecules to take place within the membrane. Now coming to the different categories of movement that is usually observed in case of the lipid bilayer. The first category of movement, as you can see, is the flippase. Now, the flippase, you can see, it is catalyzing the uh, transfer of phospholipids from the outer leaflet to the inner leaflet. So it helps in translocation of the amino phospholipids phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylserine from the extracellular to the cytosolic leaflet of the plasma membrane and thereby contributing to the asymmetric distribution of the membrane. By any chance, if any phosphatidylserine migrates to the outer leaflet, yesterday, as I said, phosphatidylserine is an important phospholipid because its presence on the outer leaflet is an indication that cell, the cell is dying. So we cannot allow phosphatidylserine to move out into the cytosolic leaflet. And if by chance any phosphatidylserine moves out into the uh, um, uh, um, cytosol, I'm sorry, extracellular, I want to say extracellular leaflet, outer leaflet, then it, this flippase enzyme with the help of ATP in ATP dependent manner, bring back that phosphatidylserine and it, uh, into the cytosolic leaflet. So flippase helps in maintaining that phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylethanolamine 
remains restricted to the cytosolic leaflet. So it helps in, or it contributes in maintaining the asymmetricness of the membrane. So that is about uh, the uh, clipase one. As I said, it plays an important role in keeping phosphatidylserine to the cytosolic leaflet of the bilayer. Next come floppase. As you can see, floppase, it moves phospholipid from the inner leaflet to the outer leaflet. It also, this is also an enzyme which uses ATP or energy to move a phospholipid from the inner to the outer leaflet. And finally, we have the last category of enzyme that is cramblase. Now these are enzymes or proteins that move phospholipid across the bilayer down this concentration gra gradient. That means if a phospholipid is higher here and lower here, it moves it down this concentration gradient. So since the movement of protein is occurring down this concentration gradient, as you can see, it is not ATP dependent. Whenever there is a higher concentration of a phospholipid on the outer leaflet, scramblase then to, in order to maintain an equilibrium between the two leaflets helps in moving that uh, phospholipid from the outer to the inner or inner to the outer. So at times what happens in case of phosphatidylserine, as you see, as you have heard by now, that it should be restricted to the inner leaflet. So at times it might happen that by moving phosphatidylserine down its gradient, we have high phosphatidylserine on the inner leaflet. So often scramblers might then move phosphatidylserine to the outer leaflet, but that shouldn't be done. So then free phase comes and again moves the phosphatidylserine back to the inner leaflet. So this is how the three enzymes work. These two enzymes need energy, but the scramblase does not need energy. As I said, that it is moving a, phospho, uh, a phospholipid down its concentration gradient. And one more thing about scramblase is that the activity of scramblase has been seen to increase with increase in the calcium concentration. So whenever there is a, a higher calcium concentration in the inside of the cell, which may be due to cell injury or apoptosis, which may be due to cell injury or apoptosis, then scramblase often comes in and helps the movement of phosphatidylserine down its concentration gradient. So it moves phosphatidylserine from the inner leaflet to the outer leaf. So the activity of uh, uh, scramblase is often associated with the calcium concentration within the cytoplasm. The next slide is a beautiful slide. I just wanted to show you how many categories of movements take place within the lipid bilayer. So there are these bone vibrations occurring within the lipid bilayer. The Tails of the fatty acid chain can rotate around their axis. So there is a rotational diffusion movement occurring within the lipid bilayer. Now, uh, there is this flip-flop movement. Just now we saw there is this flip-flop movement occurring within the lipid bilayer. And there is lateral angular, I mean, so lateral diffusion occurring within the lipid bilayer. So in a liquid state, in a fluid state, we see that there might be some undulations occurring within the membrane. The membrane is not rigid. This is the very same, uh, this is from another book, but this is the same uh, thing that we just now discussed, the presence of three category of enzymes, flipase, flopase, ATP dependent. One moves phospholipids from outside to inside, and the other moves phospholipids from inside to outside. These both are ATP dependent, talking about scramblase, it moves phospholipid along its concentration gradient in both directions. Now, so this is a fact that lipids and proteins move through the membrane. How was this proved? Because when we hypothesize something in science, we need to prove that. So this particular experiment, this often comes in your um, examinations. Now, this particular question is that 
how do how could we prove that indeed lipid and proteins move through the membrane so this experiment is the fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching of frap experiment in this particular experiment what was done you see this is a cell the cell was first fluorescently labeled all the lipid molecules we we know that a cell is covered by a plasma membrane so all the lipid molecules on the plasma membrane and by now you know that the plasma membrane is formed by a lipid bilayer so the outer leaflet leaflet of the lipid bilayer was fluorescently labeled so as you can see the cell is fluorescently labeled you can see the red color the entire of the cell is fluorescently labeled once the cell was fluorescently labeled it was viewed under fluorescence microscope next what was done next a very small region of around 5 micrometer square was taken and intense laser ready was given here so you can get, see intense laser was given here as a res, as a result of intense laser given here the this portion of the fluorescence got bleached so the this portion of the lipid molecules lose their fluorescence so you can see the bilayer exactly at the point where there was intense laser given the bilayer has lost its fluorescence so this is bleaching so the layer bilayer was bleached for about 5 micrometer square and then the bilayer was allowed to stand so after time it was seen that you can see we are seeing that fluorescently labeled phospholipids now there was no fluorescence on this phospholipids so this layer area was totally bleached but after some time it is being observed that over microscope that certain fluorescence is again being seen here so it is obvious indication that phospholipids from the nearby areas moved into this bleached areas and the bleached phospholipid moved on to the neighboring areas so this is only possible if lipid molecules can move within the bilayer so this experiment proved that lateral diffusion of lipid molecules took place this is another experiment which supports the fact when singer and nicholson provided their model for fluid mosaic fluid mosaic model again i said it was a hypothesis but that hypothesis need to be proved so this was the experimental evidence in support of the fluid mosaic model this experimental evidence was first provided by branton in 1968 what he did he used the freeze fracture electron microscopy technique so what actually he did was that in this technique how did he study the molecular arrangement this technique is done by rapidly cooling or freezing the sample of plasma membrane and then fracturing it in vacuum while it is still at minus 100 degrees centigrade then so the plasma membrane was taken and it was rapidly cooled and fractured at minus 100 degree centigrade then a knife was taken and a knife was allowed to cut through the lipid membrane now as we know that the lipid exists in form of a bilayer so there is a very finer a uh, gap between the two bilayers so a knife was allowed to pass through that bilayer the gap between the two bilayers so when the knife was allowed to pass through the gap after the fracture the sample was left in vacuum for long enough to allow some water to evaporate from the exposed surface so once i pass a knife through the bilayer then we are having we have we have opened up the bilayer and now it is left in vacuum for to allow some water to evaporate from the exposed surface 
So the moment the water is evaporating from the exposed surface, this phenomena is known as freeze etching. Once this freeze etching part was done, now the exposed surface, so this is the inner, within the inner surface of the lipid bilayer. So this exposed surface is then shadowed with electron dense combination of carbon and metal, such as platinum to provide the net necessary contrast after which organic acids were used by um, uh, this, uh, after which the organic material was not organic acids, the organic material was removed by acids to leave a metal replica for examination under electron microscopy. So when this particular structure was uh, observed in electron microscopy, the replica was almost a natural representation of the freeze etched object in the plasma membrane. And the replica actually provided the first concept that yes, indeed the Singer Nicholson's hypothetical model of uh, fluid mosaic, hypothesis of fluid mosaic model was true. So this was about the uh, proving of the experimental uh, evidence in support of fluid mosaic model of plasma. And finally, there's another experiment that we need to know is the Fry and Edidin experiment in, in 1970, where they demonstrated that membrane proteins are also capable of moving through the membrane. The first experiment where we studied the FRAP fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching, that experiment proved that lipid molecules can move within membrane. It did not prove that protein molecules can move within membrane. This experiment was done to prove that just like lipid molecules are capable of moving within the membrane, protein molecules are also capable of moving within the membrane. So for this experiment, was what was done? A mouse cell and a human cell was taken. And experimentally, now you see, mouse cell will have a set of proteins, membrane proteins. A human cell will have a set of membrane proteins. Experimentally, these two cells were fused. This fused cell was known as heterocarion. The fusion is usually carried out by the help of a virus, the Sendai virus. It helps in fusion of the two cells. Next, as I said, so when we fuse these two cells, this side of the membrane contains the human proteins and this side of the membrane contains the mouse proteins, okay? Now, we again take antibodies. These are fluorescent labeled antibodies. That is, these are protein molecules carrying a fluorescence with them. And these molecules are very specific for the mouse protein. So we use two category of antibodies. Antibodies are specific proteins. Okay, for now, let us have this concept that antibodies are specific proteins that recognize certain sequences present on another proteins. So we are having mouse proteins on this side and human proteins on this side. So we take two categories of antibodies. One antibody set of antibodies will recognize the mouse proteins and they have this green color. So they are fluorescent labeled with FIPC, FITC. So they are green color. And the human antibodies, they are labeled with a red color. So when I add these antibodies to this cell, these antibodies, the mouse protein antibodies, anti-mouse protein antibodies will bind to the mouse protein and the anti-human protein antibodies will bind to the human proteins. So if we observe this now, we will see red color on this side of the membrane and green color on this side of the membrane. So this was time zero minutes and the cells were placed in culture and incubated at 37 degrees centigrade. After 40 minutes, when the same cells 
were observed on the microscope, it was seen that there is no definite <coughs> green color on one side and no definite red color on one side. Rather, there is a mixture of colors. So it is obvious that the proteins have moved, the mouse and the human proteins have moved through the membrane. And now what we see is the admixture of color throughout the cell. No distinct coloration is recognized. So this experiment proved that indeed, just like lipid molecules can show lateral movement through the membrane, the protein molecules can also show lateral movement through the lipid bilayer. So for today, we'll stop here.